Today, I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Swan Private. Now, you know from listening to this show that our money is broken. Fortunately, we have Bitcoin, a better money that will help us build a brighter future. But if you don't have a Bitcoin strategy and a trusted partner to help you execute that strategy, then you're probably going to fall behind. Now, I've known the Swan Bitcoin team for years. The Bitcoiners at Swan are mission driven and have deep expertise and respect in the Bitcoin space. In my opinion, this is the team you want on your side. Today, I'd like to highlight Swan's private client services division, which guides high net worth individuals and businesses around the world toward building and preserving wealth with Bitcoin. So visit swanprivate.com and learn how this concierge service gives you direct access to your dedicated Bitcoin advisor by phone, messaging, and email. Swan will guide you on complex areas such as self-custody, or you can choose to hold your Bitcoin through Swan with one of the largest U.S. regulated custodians. So make your first purchase with Swan Private and get $100 of Bitcoin. Just tell them that I sent you. You know, an opportunity like this to build and preserve legacy impacting wealth for your family and company will not likely be seen again in our lifetimes. Sign up at swanprivate.com today, mention breed love to your advisor and get $100 in free Bitcoin when you make your first buy. Mr. John Leak and Mr. Peter McCullough, welcome to the What Is Money show. Thank you. Thank you. Glad to have both you guys here. I know uh, our mutual friend, George Gammon introduced us and you guys have a book out. Um, titled The Courage to Face COVID-19. Um, do you guys want to tell us a little bit about the book and uh, maybe point the audience to a website and then we'll jump into some questions. Thanks for having us, Robert. The Courage to Face COVID-19, it has a subtitle, it's a bit of a mouthful, Preventing Hospitalization and Death While Battling the Biopharmaceutical Complex. Uh, the website, which people can easily learn our bios and more about the book, um, courage to face covid.com. And this is a, a work of true crime. I'm a true crime author. I've written some books about serial killers and missing persons mysteries. They had strong forensic medical components. When SARS CoV 2 arrived in the United States and started spreading around, I perceived that our federal health agencies and our mainstream media weren't telling the truth about it, that there were distortions, perhaps even um, acts of, of, of fraudulent misrepresentation, and a great deal of propaganda using very tried and true methods of propaganda. I realized I needed a top medical scientific authority to help me to interpret a lot of the, 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 the technical medical aspects of this. Uh, so I found um, Dr. McCullough, who is censored on some social media platforms, so we're judicious in how we refer to him. Dr. McCullough um, is a guy who I joined forces with here in Dallas, and we've written this book together. It's just come out. It's a work of true crime with a strong medical element in which we examine this pandemic crisis that was visited upon the entire human race and how Dr. McCullough and his colleagues, um, how they went against the orthodoxy, they went against the empire to try and treat patients and then um, once they came under fire themselves, um, then it, it became a crusade to maintain the integrity of our constitutional republic. Um, so Dr. McCullough went from being a treating doctor to a major public figure who is, is, is trying to defend our republic. I'll let Dr. McCullough talk. Well, that's a great introduction to the book, uh, John. And uh, as you mentioned, you know, I'm a practicing physician. I'm in practice in Dallas, Texas. I see and examine patients every week. Haven't really taken a week off since the onset of the pandemic was on the scramble to find ways of treating patients initially. And I think what really spurred the book is, is for the first time in my career and doctors in my circle, 
uh, we actually felt uh, obstructionist forces at work that were blocking our abilities to try to save lives. Our attempts to relieve suffering were intentionally subverted and blocked, undermined. And as a result, patients suffered. More hospitalizations and deaths occurred far more than ever needed to happen. And so John, as a true crime author, an investigative specialist, created a timeline and sat down with me and so many doctors. You know, this is a worldwide phenomenon. Work with them to get the careful notes down of exactly what transpired and then put this complex reality into a narrative, into a story that's readable, it's fast, it's fun, so people can understand actually what happened during this first two years of the crisis. Wow, well, I appreciate your guys' work, and I think it's important, as you said, to wrap it in something that's readable and accessible to kind of throw light on all of these, uh, let's say, bad practices that have taken place. Uh, you know, John, you mentioned to me offline that you have some you had, a, I think you said you have an investing background and some interest in the Federal Reserve. What is, and I would love to hear from both of you on this question, actually, what is the relationship between what I think you termed the biopharmaceutical complex and the, the fiat currency complex? And maybe another way to phrase this is, is there a relationship between the central planning of our financial system and what appears to be the central planning of modern medicine? For, for sure. Um, what, the, what we call the biopharmaceutical complex, it's a, it's a general analog to the military industrial complex that President Eisenhower warned about in his farewell address in 1961, which is very closely related to our complex of, of federal finance. Um, our, our federal reserve system, um, as it relates to our treasury department, and this, this vast network of money creation. And our founding fathers warned about you know, what happens if the creation of money comes unmoored from anything like fiscal discipline, from you know, the need to direct money at useful enterprise, and not just to one's well-placed friends in, in, in the banking industry or the military industry, or and now we get into modern medicine, where I think modern medicine is really a high, high octane version of all of this, because what we see happening in 08 and 09 is this recognition that a crisis is actually, for some well-positioned persons and institutions, a crisis is actually a great thing because it, it, it causes the central banks of the world to generate vast amounts of money to intervene in the bond market. Suddenly, you have this massive transfer of wealth you know, in through the back door of these institutions. And I think what these biopharmaceutical complex players, and a lot of them come out of technology um, and have had a ringside seat into what happened in 08 and 09, they realized, well, a public health crisis will prompt the same mechanism of action that, you know, suddenly overnight, the governments will come in and generate trillions of dollars of money. And if we are well positioned with our purported solutions to the crisis, then we'll get all of the money, which is precisely what happened. And, you know, but instead of saying, you know, gee whiz, we're JP Morgan or Washington Mutual, or, you know, we're about to go down the tubes, um, you know, can you give us, can you buy $600 billion of bonds from our crappy, mortgage-backed security portfolio. It's, hey, we've got this vaccine that we've put together at warp speed. You know, how about taking down, you know, $100 billion of doses? And how about giving us the R&D money? And while you're at it, how about assuming the liability and the advertising and the distribution costs? So crisis is a good thing if you're in the right position to benefit from it. And that's that's what we're seeing in all of this. Peter, do you have views about that, the connection between yeah, this yeah, vast yeah. medical well, you, complex? Right. So you can see some of these um, economic observations coming to the fore. So, for instance, 
uh, you don't see any competition. Competition is a, a, and product preference is a natural economic force, right? So people choose products. So right now there's no competition between Moderna and Pfizer. Uh, there, there's no competitive claims between, is, is one better than the other? How about Johnson Johnson, AstraZeneca? In Europe, we have Novavax and, uh, and have uh, Sinovac, Coronavac. There doesn't appear to be any competitive market forces. We hear uh, a talk in the media and doctor's offices here, just take a vaccine, take any vaccine. Since when do we do that? I mean, do, don't products naturally compete with one another? Isn't there a winner? Isn't there a loser? And isn't there one in between? You know something's wrong when you don't see competitive market forces. You know something's wrong when you don't see purchase and then consumption. So it was announced uh, recently that the CEO of Moderna, Stefan Banzel, was declaring large wastage of Moderna. They were actually going to waste doses, tens of millions of doses. Then in the United States, we heard many tens of millions of doses being wasted. Well, companies should only produce as much as consumer demand exists. What happened in these arrangements was pre-purchase. So there was already pre-purchase. The same thing has happened with some other products. I'll give you another example of the crisis where you can tell economics and, and market forces are disturbed. And that's remdesivir. That's a chapter in our book, remdesivir. Remdesivir is an intravenous polymerase inhibitor. Uh, we can use it in acute treatment. Uh, it had hope initially in 2020. It was repurposed, a drug tried in Ebola. And it turns out in the largest trials, the best done trials, it, it didn't reduce mortality. In fact, mortality was worsened. There was kidney injury and liver injury. The World Health Organization did the largest trial, convened a meeting. They went over all the data in 2020. They had ethicists, uh, critical care doctors. I mean, this was a very weighty event in, in the pandemic response. And the WHO said, listen, we can't let this go, go forward. We got to shut it down. Do not use this product. It doesn't work. It's actually going to result in more loss of life. European Society of Critical Care signed on and they said, don't use it. Don't use it. World Health Authority says don't use it. And what happened in America is our CMS, our DHSS and CMS, they actually put a 20% bonus on the hospital payment. It's like a tip on the entire bill if, if remdesivir is going to be used. It's about a $3,000 drug. And you know we use drugs in the hospital. I'm a doctor. I order drugs in the hospital all the time. And even if a drug costs a few hundred dollars or a few thousand dollars, I wouldn't get a tip on the entire higher hospitalization. Let's say a hospitalization is $200,000. That's $40,000 extra if this drug is used. And the World Health Organization says don't use it. Well, hospital administrators couldn't resist the financial incentives that the US passed down and countless Americans. There were 10 million hospitalizations in the United States. The utilization rate is about 25%. That means a massive number of people were exposed to a potentially deadly drug. And their analysis suggests that the loss of life, we lost a million lives, a million American lives. Some of it was contributed through what we call a perverse incentive. So these are not you know, economic drivers. Economics, there is medical economics. They are not playing out in pandemic response because of the stranglehold the biopharmaceutical complex has on the entire response. Wow. Um, shocking. I did not, I did not know those numbers. Um, but point is well taken. I mean, competition is what keeps producers honest in the marketplace. If you don't have as a consumer, if you don't have different options of producers to choose from, and you only have one producer, well, that's a monopolist, right? That's the opposite of what you want in a healthy and thriving market economy. And the point is also taken that, you know, giving government power in an emergency, I think there's a quote about this, will just ensure that emergencies are created so governments can take more power. And that certainly seems to be what's been going on. And if you look at, if you just look at the financial charts of central bank actions over the past two years, and you didn't know what was going on in the world, it's basically indistinguishable from wartime, right? It used to be in the past, we'd go to war to get all these emergency powers and excuses to print money and pass new regulations, et cetera, et cetera. 
But now, I guess, maybe in the post-nuclear world, we just needed a, a different type of war for governments to get all these excuses. You, Let you me really, ask you, you, you sorry, John, go ahead. Nail, you just hit, I'm sorry to interject, but you just hit the nail on the head. I mean, that that's that's the story. So taking a leaf from um, President Eisenhower's warning, it, it's very clear what's going on here. If we go all the way back to James Madison, our founding father, he was really concerned about allowing military interests to get really organized and entrenched and established in the new republic. Because in his view, if we get a big navy and a big standing army, its leadership is actually going to seek entanglements and conflicts. It's not going to be, let's defuse them. Let's see if we can avoid getting drawn into this destructive conflict. No, no, it's going, let's get involved. You know, let's see if we can get a base up and running. Let's see if we can get money for a new shipyard to get cranking. You know, we we, we want to be able to get out there and, and fight it out with these guys because it's what we do. It's, 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 it's why we're here. It's what we've trained for. And it's what we want to make a living at. So... Madison warned about this, and, and I, I really think that the evidence, the totality of circumstances indicates that our, our biopharmaceutical complex, it's this recognition that military enterprise is messy. You know, if you're trying to ex expand and extend your control across jurisdictions, sending armed soldiers using violence, it's, it's very inefficient, it's messy, it's bloody, there's all kinds of blowback. But if you can invoke a medical emergency and present yourself not as a warrior who's coming in with violence, but as a, a benefactor of mankind who's coming in with a, a vaccine that is going to save all of us like some panacea, you know, now you really have hit upon a mechanism of central governance of all of mankind without firing a shot, but with governments picking up the bill for the whole enterprise. Yeah, it certainly seems quite insidious um, and it kind of a, I guess, an adaptive response by government. They, they know that a hot war is not so palatable these days, so you just have to adapt the narrative to new technological realities, I suppose. Um, and speaking of technology, let me ask you guys this. So there is this specter of a digital health pass or a digital health passport. I think this goes under a few different names, depending on the jurisdiction. I'm wondering how you think this might be used and especially how it might be used in conjunction with something like central bank digital currencies to enforce compliance. You know, there, there have been thoughts out there that people would resist some new universal global identity system. But if you tied it to something like a central bank digital currency and said, hey, we're going to turn off your money if you don't adopt this new identification system, that that might, that might be a useful lever for governments to really get this implementation in place. Uh, I would love to hear both of your guys' thoughts on that. Well, you know, it, the, the connection to what's considered social credit is a, a key concept. We, we've actually already seen it at work. So there was a news a briefing out of Santiago, Chile, where if someone had not taken one of the, uh, you know, the, the pandemic novel biological uh, preventive uh, mandated products that in fact they couldn't get money out of an ATM. Uh, we saw this when uh, renegade truckers uh, tried to shut down Ottawa to, to have a discussion on whether or not these mandates should go forward. You know what the response that really shut that down was freezing bank accounts. Not physical removal, not uh, you know, not uh, uh, you know, not all-out conflict, but actually freezing bank accounts, personal and business, including the supporters. You know, they, these are unprecedented times 
right now, but you're right. It looks like the financial strings are in play now. And the financial strings are in play. Uh, in theory, it would be for good. It would be for social good. Uh, but we can already see some examples where uh, nefarious intent could have catastrophic effects, especially those at the highest uh, wealth strata. You know, there's, there, there is um, something of, of a precedent for public health initiatives or, or measures being expressly used for, you know, for social and, and political control. Um, you know, when, when the uh, National Socialist Party came to power in Germany in, in 1933, it's very interesting to look at the relationship of the regime with the medical community. I mean, it was really the first time that doctors, scientists, medical scientists, you know, were really played a key role in, um, in this radical um, totalitarian regime. And um, I mean, that's a whole podcast unto itself is the practice of, of scientific science and medicine under the Third Reich. But um, you see these public measures to control typhus, for example, and uh, there's a lot of propaganda that is tied in with where you see particular groups and to the regime and to the body politic identified as carrying a higher disease risk or a higher typhus risk. You can see this sort of perfidious logic of this that, you know, then you start rounding up people who are deemed dangerous or undesirable and you start placing them in concentration camps. And then you say, well, we have a de-lousing agent um, for eliminating uh, typhus bearing lice. We're going to need you to come into this chamber. And, we're, and so you, there's a kind of a, 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 a devilish progression that you know that we see in this and that should really terrify everybody um a lot of people think oh the the barbarism and the horrors of germany in the 30s and the 40s it's because the germans are barbarians but in fact it's the opposite germany was the most developed country in europe i mean this is a country of of the most advanced universities <laughs> you know um system of, of some of the greatest composers and poets and philosophers and scientists the world has ever seen. This is a highly advanced society that was corrupted by a very, very bad political regime. And Americans are quite naive if they think that that can't happen to us. The only thing that's standing between us and a similar catastrophe is the United States Constitution, the law. The Constitution, as long as that sovereign and our judiciary properly administrates the law, then I think we're relatively safe. But these emergency powers, like the Enabling Act in Germany in 1933 after the Reichstag fire, I hear a politician start talking about invoking emergency power and I get extremely nervous. Yeah, well said. Uh, the, the freezing of the bank accounts in particular, I mean, that is a blatant attack on private property. And this is, as many libertarian philosophers have written about, this is the foundation of civilization. If you don't have private property, you have nothing else. There are no human rights. Uh, that are not built on top of private property, because if you don't have uh, exclusive rights to the fruits of your labor, what other rights can you possibly have? It just doesn't make any sense. So I'm very unnerved by things like we saw in Canada as well. And then the the ambiguity of this social good, you know, this is this opens up a lot of arbitrariness where you can just draw, you can circumscribe anything or any group of people or any activity as for the social good or not. And it just it introduces a lot of opportunity for politicians to engage in rhetoric to justify just about anything. So it's very, very concerning. Um, let me and ask we've you. Seen, we, Sorry, I was go ahead. Comment. We've seen along the lines of social good, we've seen a lot of destabilizing of uh, events over the last few years, from uh, from the the short-lived Me Too movement uh, to Black Lives Matter. 
to uh, now this um, gender ambiguity movement, uh, a rebirthing of a controversy of a Roe Ro versus Wade, uh, election integrity, uh, pandemic response. Uh, th there's just been a whole series of destabilizing events, m meaning, you know, this, this, this idea that we could even identify social good is going to be uh, something that's going to be uh, challenging. But I think everybody should be disturbed with uh, the complete abrogation of due process and due process everywhere, including corporate governance, uh, government operations, the courts, the military, the complete lack of, of due process. And how did this happen? It happened with pandemic response and a false narrative that any person at any time could spread the organism to someone else. So therefore we can't meet in person. We actually can't conduct due process. We can't do, have a, a trial by jury. Uh, we can't have board meetings. We can't uh, you know, get together and, and discuss things. We can't have any, any discussion offline. Everything's gonna be on WebEx or Zoom. So this loss of due process that you saw how that happened in Canada, you know, the bank accounts were seized with no due process. There was no law that said that could happen. There was no vote to say, okay, that's going to be a good way to handle, um, you know, public uprisings. Uh, it just happened. It just happened. And, you know, we saw this uh, through Nazi Germany, through the rise of communism, the lack of due process. And now we're seeing it at the corporate level. Uh, various mandates that come down. There's no due process. It's not like there's company board votes and and, and the and the uh, um, you know the disclosure of who voted which way on a particular uh, topic. Uh, you see companies actually making decisions almost in a group think copycat manner. I mean, one of the best examples was uh, the airlines and the mask mandates. They actually didn't really have any constitutional or judicial you know, basis for even mandating to begin with. Our Center for Disease Control doesn't have executive powers of any type. They, they make recommendations basically to doctors and to patients. So this idea that the CDC would recommend a mask mandate and then the airlines would carry it out as if it was a ruling, as, as if the CDC actually has ruling powers. Then it took a federal judge in Florida to say, no, you, you can't do this. The CDC doesn't have executive powers to be able to create a ruling or an executive order or you know, a legislative vote or something that goes in as, as a house resolution. There's none of that. And so the federal judge had to say, listen, no. And as soon as the airlines, which they could have done it on their own anyway, as soon as they felt some, any type of court support, they dropped these max mandates in, in a heartbeat. And it wasn't just for the planes, they dropped it in the concourses, they dropped it in the clubs, and then not even connected to the airlines, you saw the rideshare operators drop it, and on and on and on. So there's some type of group think going on. Uh, there's been the abrogation of due process, the complete dissolution of corporate integrity and of transparency all at once. Yeah, it's truly uh, spectacular to see how fast it all happened. Um, and I, you know, again, mass psychosis. I'm going to talk to Matthias Desmet soon on the show about mass psychosis because I don't think there's anything else we can call this. Now, I'd like to tell you about a great new Bitcoin show on the scene that you've got to check out. Brought to you by Swan Studios and Bitcoin Magazine, this show is Hard Money with Natalie Brunel. Natalie is an Emmy-nominated journalist bringing unparalleled experience to the Bitcoin media scene. And personally, Natalie is one of my favorite voices in the Bitcoin space. Each week on Hard Money, you'll get the top headlines of the week with analysis you won't find anywhere else. Hard-hitting interviews with amazing guests like myself and other top minds in the Bitcoin space. And the show will take you directly into the lives being changed by Bitcoin all over the world. Check out Hard Money at swan.com backslash hard money. Today, I want to tell you about our sponsor, CrowdHealth. So how does health insurance work? You send an egregious amount of money to an insurance company. 
they hold it in a pool of depreciating fiat currency. Then when you have a large health event, you have to pay them even more via your deductible. And then you hope they will cover your bill. And in fact, one in six bills are denied by healthcare.gov plans. It's time to take control of your own healthcare bills. I'd like to introduce you to CrowdHealth. It's a decentralization of healthcare using Bitcoin as an alternative to health insurance. Instead of sending fiat currency to a big corporation, you send that money to an account controlled by you, a portion of which is converted into Bitcoin. Then if you have a big health event, you have a community of Bitcoiners that will use the money in their accounts to help you out. To get more details, go to joincrowdhealth.com backslash breedlove, where you can find the promo code for $99 a month for six months. Let me ask you guys this. So clearly, as we've outlined today already, and I know you guys have both done a lot of great work on this, there have been many unethical and even unscrupulous actions taken since March 2020 by various groups and individuals. Is there any legal action in motion against some of these bad actors? Uh, how can those that have been harmed throughout all of these events pursue justice when the very justice system seems to be the thing that's breaking down? This is, this is something that Dr. McCullough and I have spoken at length about and done, done quite a bit of head scratching. I'll, I'll let him address particular cases he's advised on. I have just had general conversations with a number of attorneys. And, and what I think is, is fascinating is, I mean, we presumably have a functioning judiciary, but every time it comes down to, okay, who is an attorney that has some cojones? Who is a plaintiff who's, who's really willing you know, to go to bat for an injured relative? Um, and like, let's start suing these people. Like, let, let's get it into the courts, get it into the forum and, and start debating it. There is this peculiar lack of, of will and courage to, you know, take off the gloves and climb into the ring. So, I mean, in theory, there are judges that would, that would listen to cases and juries that would listen to cases. But I mean, if, if, if we don't have plaintiffs with resources and attorneys with with guts and imagination to to start filing the suits i mean how is it going to get in front of our judiciary and work its way up to the supreme court um now that's a rather large generalization dr mccullough can address specific perhaps glimmers of hope you know, I think an interesting case study is the military, the US military, about 2.7 million individuals, those in uniform, those administrative roles and their family members. Uh, the military, um, you know, their biggest health concern statistically is suicide. Uh, it's far greater than the pandemic virus, far greater. Uh, military is largely fit young individuals who have a negligible, uh, you know, negligible threat of the pandemic virus. It may be some older administrators, but the younger individuals, a negligible threat and, and a large fraction have already been through the illness. So the, the inoculation would be not clinically indicated, not medically necessary, and potentially would do harm. So these mandates come down. And military members naturally say, we're, we're not going to do this. <laughs> this is, uh, uh, you know, this is investigational. It's not medically necessary, not clinically indicated. It's not along any of the lines of good clinical practice. And then the response is, well, if you don't do this, you're going to get kicked out. You're going to get kicked out, you know, on what basis? And so this kind of threat is going back and forth. And to my knowledge, there's only one person who's actually been court-martialed. And that person refused everything. He refused an inoculation. He refused uh, testing, refused to wear masks. And they said, listen, you're a malcontent. You're kicked out. Other than that, <clears throat> no one's been court-martialed. And so it's a giant game of brinkmanship. You know, who's going to carry it to the brink? And so there's, there's a flight surgeon, Teresa Long, who's a doctor. And she studied as, a, as an epidemiologist, an environmental health specialist. She said, listen, I'm not taking it. 
And there's a lot of medical reasons why I'm not taking it. Others say I was religious reasons. And the military says, you have to take it. She goes, I'm not taking it. And they're at a stalemate. And she's still in the military, still performing her jobs. And so we have these showdowns going down all over the place. You know what happened in the NBA? Kyrie Irving said, listen, I'm not taking it. They said, you have to take it. I'm not taking it. Well, then you can't play. Well, okay, I'll sit on the bench. Well, then you can only play on away games. And then you can, and the whole thing basically took on uh, from an external viewpoint, uh, basically a countenance of absurdity. So I think the key word here is absurdity. And when you talk to Matthias Desmond, he'll focus on this. When we see absurdity, we're seeing form fruist of the false narrative. We're seeing prima facie evidence that the human mind isn't thinking correctly. And people have used examples of masks, uh, you know, people swimming in swimming pools with masks or driving alone in the car. Uh, you know, it's obvious the human mind isn't thinking correctly. If you were to go to China right now and see the newsreels in Shanghai, where police officers are wearing hazmat suits and they're tackling other people and trying to exact pain and, and discipline and locking each other down, killing each other's pets. Um, you know, I can tell you, I've treated hundreds of patients, advised on thousands. We don't wear hazmat suits. They're not necessary. There's even, uh, there's even a newsreel where the Chinese are spraying each other's shoes with some type of disinfectant. You know, the organism doesn't come out of the shoes. It doesn't emanate out of the shoes. You can tell by these Chinese newsreels that people have lost their minds. They, they literally have lost their minds. I just got off a call with uh, regarding the Screen Actors Guild. The Screen Actors Guild. So actors on set who uh, have all these strict uh, mandates in place. They have all these strict mandates in place. And so what people are asking is, listen, when we get on an airplane, uh, we don't wear any masks and there's no requirements of any other type uh, and we fly. And then when we get on our set, suddenly all these mandates apply. Well, well why wouldn't they, why would mandates if they exist apply in some reasonable fashion or related to risk, for instance, maybe the risk of, exposure in a nursing home or something like that. But, but when things don't make sense that are patently ab absurd, that's a sign of the false narrative. The other thing that I would add and that I think is pertinent to, to the theme of your show and, and maybe a specific interest of your listeners, money. I mean, I've thought a lot about money over the years. And one of the things that, that money um, enables people to do if they have if they have more money um, than than um, than they really need in order to you know get by, then they have leisure time. They have time to think and and to indulge in things. I think of a lot of what's happened to our civilization with this massive generation of debt. So so debt is not financing productivity. It's not, you know, I, I, I want to plant more fields, so I need to I need to go into debt to get a John Deere tractor in order to, to finance my productivity. Debt is being used to finance consumption and a, a range of activities that aren't productive. So I think that our civilization, and I, I use this as a very loose metaphor, it sounds rather pejorative and judgmental, but I think there's an element of truth to it it's like a spoiled trust funder. And I, you know, and I grew up with a lot of these kids here in Dallas. And it's like, oh, you know, you, you your, your grandma left you a trust and you, by some catastrophe, you were given access to it when you were still very young. And they just, just the, 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 the sheer summits of absurdity of, of trouble that people get into. So I feel like, you know, you look at all of this frivolous nonsense, and my sense is it would end in one day if people actually had to do productive enterprise in order to, to, to receive funding. But there just seems to be funding available for anything. Um, <laughs> anyway, I, yeah. I hope that that did sound rather um, extravagant. Um, but I, no, no. I you know, the point that debt has a distortion not only in our economic activity but also in our thinking um 
And, and a lack of monetary discipline, I think, can result in a lack of, of personal ethical discipline. Yes. I, you know, we talk a lot about the psychological implications of money and the corruption of money on this show. And another thing we talk about a lot is it's harder for humans to deal with abundance often than it is scarcity. Like we're kind of, we've got millions of years of dealing with scarcity, but this whole like incredible amount of material abundance, people start to do kind of weird things when all of their, their lower needs are met. So, um, and it does seem that the connection to government would be they're just spending money that's not theirs ultimately they're printing money which is just taxing everyone else so it's a source of like limitless revenue of course that leads to some crazy behaviors at some point when you have you have a money printing machine of course that makes you crazy um and there's this i think it was maybe it was cicero or someone else that has this quote that the closer an empire is to collapse the crazier its laws so Peter, to your point, like the weirder things get, I think it's a it's a symptom of being closer to the end here. Yeah, I, I think one of the more alarming recent developments is the continued uh, stance that we're actually in an emergency. Uh, you know, the Biden administration, again, just renewed this. All the local authorities reviewed this. And, you know, the emergency is determined by people like me. You know, I'm in medical authority. I'm a doctor. I have medical authority. And I look around you, I can tell you if an emergency exists or not. And it was predicated on overflow of the hospitals. If we had so many cases that we overflowed the hospitals and we couldn't take care of people with other acute conditions, we've got an emergency, whether that be a, a nuclear uh, holocaust, a tsunami, a fire, a flood, that defines a health emergency when we're overwhelmed. And the estimates were that was about 15% of the US uh, available hospital beds at the time. Hospitals, by the way, have ability to build capacity far more than what people think. So uh, when I testified in the US Senate in November of 2020, I told America, I said, I just, I'm getting worried. You may not like what you see in a few months unless we start treating this illness. And uh, out of the University of Washington, the Murray model had suggested that we had about 129,000 uh, simultaneous cases. That was the breaking point. If we had that much, we'd hit this 15% capacity limit in some places and we'd be in trouble. Would be uniform, but we'd be in trouble. Well, we crested at 125,000 cases uh, at one time in January of 2021. To give you a reference point, we're now below 25,000 know, in the hospital right now. They either directly have the illness or they're in the hospital and they're concurrently testing positive. And, and just, you know, that's just how the, the numbers are, are, are arrived at. So the idea is we have been out of the emergency since January of 2021. We should have immediately declared that we're out of the emergency. All the emergency countermeasures should have been dropped. We would have had a massive reduction of, out, of outflow of our treasuries. Our treasuries have been drained basically into healthcare. And that, that doesn't provide uh, widgets. It doesn't uh, 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 you know, provide new infrastructure. It doesn't, it's basically just a sinkhole. 10% of our GDP went into a sinkhole. And many experts now think, listen, that has triggered our inflationary cycle. It, it's not a war in Ukraine that's tipped this off. It's been 10% of the GDP has been basically poured down the train in uh, unnecessary in vitro diagnostic testing, on uh, luxuriously reimbursed hospitalizations. You know, there's a paper by Fillmore and colleagues in the VA caught my attention. 45% of hospitalizations never had an oxygen saturation below 94%. These hospitalizations are panic hospitalizations. A recent paper that uh, I'm going to review a little later on today on national uh, TV. So um, I have the citation, a recent paper by, uh, by Shine and colleagues that appeared in JAMA of children hospitalized for the condition, of which there's very few children hospitalized for the condition. Um, uh, in a big health system, 1959 hospitalizations between, you know, over the course of uh, nearly two years of the pandemic, 
uh, only 12% of these ended up on the mechanical ventilator. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you right now, it's, it's uh, 88% are simply getting some nebulization and, and going home. It's, it's, just, it's just reassurance. So we have a situation where the overall gravity has been grossly overestimated and continues to be grossly overestimated today. So again, people would understand absurdity when our federal government declares a federal emergency and you get on a packed plane of 400 people. You go in restaurants and everyone's uh, you know, laughing and dining and you look around you, everything's normal. You go into any hospital, everything looks normal. You go into any clinic, everything looks normal. Where's the federal emergency? Yeah, well said. Yeah, I just I keep coming back to mass psychosis to some extent here, um, uh, and I'm I'm reminded of that it's somewhat of a joke, but I think it's kind of serious. If you want the pandemic to end, just turn off the TV. All right, we're getting these these little software updates, if you will, from state sponsored media, and if you just stop taking the updates, then you kind of wake up to the reality around you. Um, Robert, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to, to interrupt. Um, I've got to jump on another podcast in a few minutes. Um, but I, I, I would like to conclude with what I think is kind of a humorous note. There was a famous physician uh, in Paris during the Belle Epoque. His name, he was a Swede. His name was Axel Munta. And he was a celebrated physician in his day. And at the end of his life, he wrote his memoirs. He was kind of... The, I mean, he did some hardcore stuff in the trenches with infectious disease outbreaks in Europe. He was a real heroic, brave man. But a lot of his day-to-day -day practice was the a Parisian upper class. He was very popular amongst Parisian ladies, rather handsome guy and had great manners. Anyway, he kind of assembles this upper class clientele in Paris. And he talks, the funniest scenes in his memoirs where he talks about Suddenly, every upper class lady in Paris simultaneously thinks she's suffering from colitis. Just they all come to his office. I'm suffering from colitis. And so this, this power of suggestion, the mind is almost infinitely pliable to suggestion. So they're at a tea party and some girl says, I think I have colitis. Well, what's that? Well, it's a bowel irritation. Well, I think I have it too. I better go see Dr. Munta. So we should be frightened about the power of, uh, suge of suggestion, particularly where our adolescent children are concerned. They are very, very unstable emotionally, very vulnerable to suggestion of all kinds. Um, that's getting into mental health. On that note, I'm going to ring off. Um, and I thank you for this wonderful, uh, I've heard great things about you from George. Um, I hope you're surfing in Puerto Rico. It has good surf, I've heard. And um, I hope to talk to you again soon. Thank you, John. Thank you for coming on. It's been great to have thank you. Thank you. Peter, I'll I'll, I know you've only got a little bit of time here, so I'll, I'll wrap it up with this. It seems to me that well, first of all, I heard this recently that many doctors practicing today don't even know what the Nuremberg trials were, which was startling. And, you know, just for the audience, I mean, I, I consider this and this is based on the work of, uh, you know, a lot of famous Russian authors, I think Solzhenitsyn wrote about this. Um, most, it was essentially the most significant ethical event of the 20th century, right, that we collectively post World War was post-World War II, I believe, came to this conclusion that there are some things that are just flat out wrong. There are things that are just unethical. Even if you're doing just doing your job or just following your orders, it's not okay to put people in a gas chamber, right? It's not okay to engage in genocide, things like this. And it seems like our memory, our collective memory is just so short. I mean, this only happened, what are we, 75-ish years ago? And now we've just completely lapsed back into this idea of mandating certain medical procedures or or modalities how like did we just not learn from the nuremberg trials is that what we're going through again that history's rhyming and that we we just didn't learn the lessons when we should have learned the lessons we're not respecting them i i, I think we've learned them. they clearly have been presented 
to us, uh, you know, our country has an Office of Human Research Protections, OHRP, and they uh, hold uh, the whole biopharmaceutical complex to six principles, six cornerstones. The first one is the Declaration of Helsinki, which says no matter what you're doing medically, you must get a full, fair, informed consent, period. You, you know, you can't have anything done to you unless you get a fair consent, okay? And consents have to be updated. You know, with the novel biological products, once they were released, they only had two months of testing. Most of what we've learned about these products has occurred since their release. You know, the consent forms haven't been updated to tell people what's going on with them. I mean, so Declaration of Helsinki has gone out the window. Uh, the second is the Nuremberg Code. So from the Nuremberg trials became the code. And the code said, no one any, under any circumstances may receive any pressure, coercion, or threat of reprisal for any medication or medical procedure happening to their body, period, period. You cannot be pressured to have a pill shoved down your throat. No matter how much people want to shove that pill down your throat, you have the right to basically not receive that pressure. You cannot be pressured. And you can see how the Nuremberg Code's been thrown out the window. Do you know employers? Employers are pressuring people to take the mandated products. This has even gone to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court has struck it down. And they still, there are still companies that are telling employees that they can't come back to work unless they take one of these or they're going to lose their job and they're being threatened and they're being bullied. I, I, I mean, you know, again, I, I, what else does this take? I mean, why, why, didn't, why don't the companies just take out rifles and put them to the heads of their employees and tell them what they want to do? Right. I mean, you know, it's, you go to the highest court of the land, they throw them out as being unconstitutional. And employers still do it, I, I, you know. Th this uh, this type of uh, situation now. Now the saving grace is we have a very contracted workforce, very contracted, especially at the higher skill level jobs, super contracted right now. And so there's jobs all over the place. And so what will happen is market forces will happen, and people say, "Listen, I'd rather go to this employer because you know they don't have these mandates." And then people are going to start to move around. And before you know it, employers are going to say, listen, we're, we're going to start losing because, you know, employees are basically a form of capital for, for businesses. And it's already happening. You saw it in the airlines. You're going to see it elsewhere. Starbucks, you know, FedEx, uh, MGM, Amazon, you know, drop, 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 just drop, dropping these uh, across the board. Uh, but this whole idea that an employer that an employer would do that. What people are asking is what's behind that? Who made the decision? No one seems to know. None of the company CEOs will come out and say, you know, who's responsible for that? Nobody will reveal any board votes. Uh, and what many are thinking is that there may be COVID relief funding or what's called emergency countermeasures. Again, as long as you declare an emergency, there can be this unchecked flow of money. Are large employers receiving flows of money to get a quota of employees to take them, uh, even against their will. And is that what's going on? You can imagine the Freedom of Information Act, since the monies do come from federal sources, it's gonna be open to get a FOIA requests in. Can you imagine when all this comes out, if indeed employers were violating the Declaration of Helsinki, the Nuremberg Code, and having their employees take investigational or experimental products against their will to keep their job. And to make matters worse, if they've been injured or disabled or lost their lives because they've done this. So, you know, Lincoln National is out with a report today, 163% increase in life insurance claims since the release of the mandated products. 163%. Most people have their life insurance through employment. And so, you know, you can put two and two together. What's changed? You know, you know, doing work from home on WebEx probably didn't cause mortality to skyrocket. 
Right. But taking a product which has in the consent form, one of the side effects is death. It's in the consent form. I mean, you put two and two together, uh, that's where we're at. Now, these are astronomical numbers. These are astronomical economic employment business shifts that are taking place right before our very eyes. Yeah, great, great points there. And a very just scary, I guess, to see. It just happened. This all happened so fast, right? Things seem pretty normal in the Western world <laughs> up until 24-ish months That's ago. What I think. Yeah. And now it just seems like everything's going off a cliff. Um, do you think this culminates in like a Nuremberg trials 2.0 type of event? Like it, everything just seems to keep getting worse before it gets better. It, how do you, I know you've only got a minute here. It's maybe just a 60 second blurb of where you see all this going and how you think it ends up. As far as we can see, the courts are corrupted right now. So, uh, you know, jury trials, uh, the courts have all, been under some type of complicity with all of that. I think the courts are corrupt. So there's no fairness there. The, the corporate boardroom seems to be, have been co-opted or corrupted. The health systems have. Uh, this syndicate that exists between the WHO, the World Economic Forum, Gavi, CEPI, EcoHealth Alliance, NIH, CDC, FDA, Health Canada, the National Health Service, the Wuhan Institute of Virology Biosafety Level Lab 4 Annex, they all seem to be working in some coordinated fashion right now. I mean, we saw powerful forces uh, as the World Economic Forum and the WHO were meeting. WHO wanted a treaty. They actually wanted legally binding capabilities of controlling major healthcare decisions within countries like declaring emergencies. I mean, we're, we're seeing things, uh, Klaus Schwab, who heads up the World Economic Forum, he published one of the most disturbing books of all time. It's called The Great Reset, where, where he said, we want to use this as an opportunity to reset a new world order. He said it in the open. Uh, Bill Gates in 2010 published it. You know, he wants it to be the decade of mass indiscriminate inoculation. I mean, it's in the open. It's in the open. Things are completely off the rails. And what's being done right now is about two thirds of the world has taken indiscriminately uh, some type of novel biologic product. That Th those are the actual numbers, two thirds of the, the world population. Two thirds of the world. CDC says 82% of Americans have taken at least one of them. Wow. Now, th these aren't conventional types of products. They are novel genetic products that install a genetic code that was devised and manipulated and first reported out in a biosecurity lab in Wuhan, China, uh, that the code appears to be long lasting in the body. That's been shown in a paper by from Stanford at all. Doesn't get out of the body. It produces clearly a dangerous and in fact, lethal protein called the spike protein. We call it the Wuhan spike protein. So everyone in America who's taken one of these has taken a genetic installation of a protein that, that is potentially lethal and at the minimum is disease promoting. And it promotes, and the FDA and all the regulatory agencies agree, it promotes heart damage. In fact, it causes heart damage. FDA is telling us that. It promotes blood clotting. In fact, causes blood clotting, causes brain damage, nerve damage promotes blood disorders. There's over a thousand peer-reviewed publications on this, some of which the NIH is publishing. So this idea that one could be mandated to take an injection of the genetic code for a manipulated lethal protein devised in China and into an American body, and American companies would force this on their own workforce indiscriminately, with no assurances on long-term safety, none. You know, some companies have no exceptions. Even if someone had a fatal reaction to one of the components in prior administrations, they still would have to take it. Even the military, I was aware of a case in the military, a young cadet, he actually sustains heart damage with the first shot. 
under no circumstances medically, I'm a cardiologist, I can tell you medically, should he take the second shot? Under no circumstances. Remember, he's a young kid, he's already had COVID. He's, he has no measurable benefit whatsoever, only harm. His entire military career is ahead of him. In fact, he's already damaged to the point where he's probably not gonna be someone who's gonna be um, uh, you know, enlisted when he's done in the academy. He's, he's pretty much done probably from the damage of the first shot. He's basically being asked to take a fatal shot by his commanders all the way up to Lloyd Austin. I mean, to me, that sounds like Nazi Germany. That says, listen, go down to the chamber and get in there. And I'm telling you to do this. It sounds just like it. We're doing it to ourselves. American companies are doing this to their workforces. And the, the question is, why? What has gotten in their minds? Is, is it just a disturbia? Is it mass formation psychosis? Is it the, is it the heaviest federal bribes of all time? Is it, just, is it just people being cruel to one another? I mean, don't they care? I mean, there's other workers. Uh, you know, there's, there's uh, tour groups that do this to each other, schools that do this to each other. You know, the Screen Actors Guild is doing it to each other. Yeah. They, they should be friends. They would want to work together. Why, why would do they want to injure e e each other? You know, th these products basically don't do what they're supposed to do. I think everyone would understand this. We've seen people who are doubled and tripled and quadrupled and, and they get it anyway. And it's a very mild syndrome right now. Anyway, mm -hmm. whether you've taken zero or you've taken four, it's the same. It's like a cold. So, so this idea that it obviously doesn't work. And our CDC has said it doesn't work. And the FDA is saying it's, they're not safe. Uh, the, the fact that these still would be absolutely in people's minds every day. You know, I never want to say the word ever again. This is actually in people's minds every day. It's, an, right. it's basically become a menace. I've said on national TV, the day the mandates are pulled and the products are pulled will be a national holiday. I tell you, it, it'll be a holiday for me because mm. uh, I, I'll just, I'll celebrate World Council for Health, which represents 70 international organizations uh, just on the 11th of June, you know, after many, many safety warnings is officially calling for worldwide product recall, get them all off the market, get them all off wow. the market, you know, and they, wow. and they put together a pharmacovigilance report with every piece of data. They have, they've passed every single threshold of alarm and concern injuries, deaths, 3.5 million injuries, 40,000 certified deaths worldwide, and the number could be much larger. Pantazatos and Seligman from Colombia, they think the US number is 287,000 at the upper confidence limit ba based on US census and, administra and administration data for the products. That, that's consistent with bumping the life insurance claims, which for sure are happening. You know, there's a more than a dozen U.S. life insurance right. companies, and, and the numbers are astronomical. It fits with the Columbia analysis. It's happening. Wow. Well, I'm very grateful for the work you're doing, shining light on this. Um, for whoever is out there that's facing these pressures, I mean, there's always a choice, right? You don't have to comply. Do not comply if you're. <laughs> if it does not, like you gave the example of the cadet, if it doesn't suit your purposes don't comply. Um, Peter, thank you so much. I really appreciate you doing this. Um, if you could just let my audience know where they can find out more about you or your work or your book, that would be great. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So uh, the book, you go to courage to face covid.com and uh, go to that website, read about the authors, and I'll give you a link to um, the portal to purchase it. And then uh, I've got a link tree set up on social media, petermccullohmd.com. That'll take you a link tree to all my social media. Um, I have a very popular Twitter following on p underscore mccullohmd. Again, that's through the link tree. And, and probably the most popular way that people follow me is on the McCullough Report. I 
I'm on talk radio on Saturday and Sunday, America Out Loud Talk Radio, McCullough Report. And I, I interview and I bring on people from all over the world because this is a worldwide problem. When you turn on major TV, like I'm getting ready to go on US major TV tonight. And I'm, I'm a few, most of you know me because I'm on the TV. Notice how there's never any non-American doctors on. And this is a global problem. And hmm. to me, I'm just stunned that we have become so insular that we can't talk to another doctor in another part of the world about what they're doing. So I bring on doctors from all over the world uh, on the McCullough Report, bring up contemporary issues. Uh, Eric Clapton helped me start the music segment. So we have music uh, regarding issues of the day on and, and, and the rules are the original artist has to send me the music and we kind of decide uh, if it goes on the show or not. It's a great show. It appears on both Saturday and Sunday with Encores. Go to America Out Loud Talk Radio. Then it hits the podcast network on uh, Tuesdays. And then it's a, a podcast, but it's uh, very, very popular. Because it's so popular, by the way, we started Pulse. And Pulse goes Monday through Friday, I believe, 5 Eastern on America Out Loud Talk Radio. That's the one time people get to have their questions answered. You know, the one thing we found is the biggest desire among Americans is to be able to ask questions. Do you know our public health agencies have offered no public forum to answer questions on the pandemic? Our hospitals and clinics have had no public seminars, health systems, nothing, medical schools, nothing. And, and, and you know, th there are individual freedom groups that have held seminars. I've done well more than 50 of them across the nation. And we have 500 to 5,000 people show up I give a very uh, careful review of the data, you know, in grand rounds format, every uh, slide is, is cited and it's very careful in my analysis. When I go on TV, Americans know me, I cite the literature exactly. So people can look it up for themselves and see where we're going on this. And I give programs for, um, for lawmakers and then for doctors and big public programs. I've done it all over the country and they can't be censored. They're just, they're very, very uh, popular. Uh, but now more than any time is the heyday of independent media like your show, because people want to have fair discourse and, and they mm -hmm. don't want filters on this and they are seeing filters. You know, the censorship on this is wide open now. The censorship, it's not even right. hidden. Yeah. Uh, people know there are filters and even uh, Tucker Carlson's come out. Tucker says, wherever you see censorship, go Go to right, that because right, that's yeah. where the truth is. Yeah. Uh, Joe Rogan has come out and said, where you see censorship, that's where you see your freedoms being taken away. So wherever right. you see censorship, look just beyond that because that's the freedom you're about ready to lose. And the censorship we're talking about is the freedom of speech, actually the ability to have fair scientific uh, discourse. You know, I went on Joe Rogan. I brought, uh, again, curated grand rounds, uh, medical education approved slides. I sent them to the Spotify producers ahead of time. We went over three hours of data review. Joe asked very careful questions. He, uh, I thought he was very perceptive. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he listens to learn. You know, he really is the master podcaster. And uh, it set every record under the sun. And there was blowback. There was Neil Young and Prince Harry and President Biden and Jen Psaki. And the claim was misinformation. And so the reply was, well, what slide, what study do you want to review on this? Oh, oh, I guess it's not information. We, we didn't like what Rogan said on a podcast 10 years ago. So we realized that, wait a minute, this censorship is actually not about censoring information. It's actually about personal attack and reprisal. That's right. even worse. Wow. Well, <clears throat> I appreciate your courage and the work that you're doing for humanity. We need this. We need people advocating for freedom and pursuing truth. So thank you, Peter. And thank you for, again for thank coming you. on. Thank you.